And it's especially important for those who follow the skeptics who say that Jesus' deity never appears anywhere except in the book of John. The use of authority, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. His avoidance of terms uh, like our Father in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. He's acting like God. Welcome to the Elisa Childers Podcast. My guest today is Tom Gilson. He's an author and speaker and the senior editor and ministry coordinator of thestream.org. Now, he's written a book called Too Good to Be False, How Jesus' Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. And this book claims to give us fresh insights about Jesus. Now, I know that that could sound like a red flag. Wait, new information about Jesus? We're not talking about new information about Jesus. We're talking about looking at the information about Jesus that we have in a slightly different way. And actually, it's a way that uh, hasn't really been written about in about a thousand years. So this is a very interesting topic for me to get to today. Uh, Tom, it is so great to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for inviting me, Elise. It's good to be here. Well, there's so much commentary about the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and many skeptics say, you know, this is just a story. This is uh, the events surrounding Jesus were just legendary developments. People were trying to figure out a way to explain this. And, you know, Christians are kind of silly for believing that Jesus was who he said he was or that he really did the things that the Gospels claim that he did. And um, there have been a lot of Bible studies about Jesus and even about his character and about his sinlessness and all of this, but you you talk in your book about how you approached your study of Jesus in a bit of a different way. So tell us about yeah. that as we start, and then tell us why you decided to write this book at this time. Okay. Yeah, I'll start with why I decided to write it. I, I write for the stream, stream.org. We do a lot of cultural commentary. We do a lot of discussion of things that are crazy, difficult, strange, wrong, <laughs> and, and yet I I didn't want that to be the whole story of what I was writing about because I am so impressed with the person of Jesus. I uh, amazed by him in just uh, the word is worship. I worship Jesus, and I wanted to say something about that. Plus, some different ways of looking at Jesus had come to mind. One of them, there, I guess I could say two of them. One of them is, as you said, the the skeptics look at it as a story. Well, it is a story. Let's take that seriously and let's ex examine it on story terms and see what kind of a story it is, see what kind of a main character we have. And, and then we can assess whether the skeptics theory about it being a legend makes sense. But I also took a different view of the Gospels than anybody that I know has ever taken. And that is, instead of looking at what Jesus said and what Jesus did, I looked at what he didn't say and what he didn't do. Well, that's different. And I, I, I don't know of anybody else who's tried to do that. But there's a lot of things he didn't say and didn't do, obviously. But what I mean by that is, what are some things you would expect? What are some things that we see in other uh, great men, great women, uh, great religious leaders, great people of any other type as, as we see greatness in the world? What are some ways that Jesus is different from them? And some of them really, really stand out. There are some things Jesus didn't do that make him very, very, very different from any other any other person in story or in history. Yeah, and I got to tell you, when I was reading through your book, uh, it was it was actually exciting as I'm reading through hmm. and the way you're you're bringing out some of these details I've known my whole life. I've I've watched mm -hmm. and known about Jesus my whole life, um, and just how it caused me to think about Jesus in a way that I maybe hadn't before, or maybe in a more focused mm -hmm. way, some of those details, um, looking at them in a more focused way and analyzing and asking questions about those things about Jesus. And of course, having to do with his character. I mean, doctrinally, we know Jesus never sinned. 
Um, and, okay. and it's like we know that on a certain level. But when we really think about it this way, you bring this out in a way that I've never seen anyone do before, especially in relation mm. to miracles. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I've just been watching through, uh, of course, everybody's been watching The Chosen, you know, about Jesus and yeah. and all this. And, and so I, I've been kind of watching through it. And there's this scene where Jesus is making a fire and he's, you know, he's twisting the wood and he's blowing on the fire and he's working so hard to get this fire going. And my first thought was, mm-hmm. he's just, you know, you're Jesus. All you have to do is just <laughs> nobody's around, nobody would see, mm-hmm. just start a little fire. And right. you know, if 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 I were Jesus, I might do that. Of course, you know, it's a good thing sure. I'm not Jesus. But um talk about that a little bit about that that Jesus never did a miracle for his own benefit. I had never thought about that before. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It it's it's very unusual and I, I'm, by very unusual, I don't know how to say that strongly enough. It's unique in in the fullest sense of the word. There is no one like Jesus. You think of people who have great power of some sort or other, whether it's military power, political power, economic power. Uh, there, There's no one who just uses it for the sake of others. Bonhoeffer called Jesus the man for others, and he was. He you know, I think of, and I tell the story in the book of when this really happened. I was at a Michigan State football game. I was a student at Michigan State. We were playing Notre Dame, and twice in that game, I said, Notre Dame had the football. I said, this would be a good time for them to fumble. Twice, both times they did, and Michigan State got the ball. That was actually weird. That was that was that was really weird. It's like, oh my goodness, what do I do with this now? My friends are saying, Tom, you can't be trusted with that kind of power. <laughs> and I thought, well, my good, you know, think of the money you could make in Las Vegas, but and, and the <laughs> careers you could destroy. The uh, the the thing I realized is I can't be trusted with that kind of power. I could not be trusted with the ability to cause a football fumble because I would eventually, no matter how good a person I chose, desired, wanted to be, I would eventually need some money. And I would call Las Vegas and I would place a bet and I would make it win. And I know I would do that. And I know anybody would. Jesus had way more power than football fumbles. Oh my goodness. And he, he you know, absolute power corrupts, as Lord Acton said. Jesus was as completely uncorrupted with power as you could imagine a person being. He was, if you look at all the most self-sacrificial characters in all of history or literature, he stands out. He is, he is completely giving. There's nobody like him. Power and love just don't come in one package, yeah. but they do in Jesus. Yeah, it's astonishing. Now, I, I assume you've mm-hmm. had some skeptical pushback on some of these, like maybe somebody comes up with a miracle. Well, maybe this could be, you know, interpreted that Jesus did this with a little bit of self-serving. So what are some of those that maybe some people have brought up? My favorite one came from Mike Lacona, another Christian <laughs> apologist. He said, well, he healed Peter's mother-in-law and she got up and served them. I looked at it and I said, Mike, that proves two things. One, you know your Bible really well and <laughs> Two, you're a smart aleck. But <laughs> the, uh, no, the, the thing that I've heard from atheists is, is pushback is that actually he, he wasn't that good. And they don't talk about, the, they, they don't push back on the issue that I bring up. They push back on other issues like Jesus, you know, if he'd been really good, he would have banned slavery or he would have uh, introduced gay marriage or some such thing that they think would have been a good thing for Jesus to do. Uh, he would have taught them to boil their bandages when they put them on wounds or something like that. It's been really good. That's been the pushback that they've gotten, but they don't push back on the main point, which is mm. his self-sacrificial, other-giving love. Yeah. And you mentioned a moment ago that he's better than anybody in history. He's better than the most, you know, high charactered uh, fiction characters we could come up with, uh, mm-hmm. just there are, and there are a lot of examples of those that have shown excellent character. But if you really examine each one, at some point they fail to live up to Jesus' character, which is you know I've always struggled with those kind of Jesus or Christ figures that are in some of right. our mythological movies because people will say, oh, there's it's this Jesus character, and you're like, yeah, but 
No, Mm -hmm. (laughs) because he's not like Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, trying to think of maybe the most fantastical one we could think of being somebody like, I don't know, like a Superman or something. Um, How how can we reason through that question? Because we can't, I don't, it seems like we can't even make up somebody as good as Jesus, as hard as we try. No, we can't. We can't. I, uh, you know, you could say Alvin was the most perfect character who ever lived. He was really powerful and always giving the end. It, it's really hard to make an interesting story about a perfect character. That was one of the pushbacks mm. that I got, by the way, was from a, a YouTuber named Paul Logia. Is that what he calls himself? And he said, he, he heard, he didn't read the book. He heard part of an interview, or maybe he did, heard the whole interview I did on it with Frank Turek. And he he got off on this thing about Jesus being a perfect character. He said, perfect character? That's awful. They have perfect characters in fan fiction, and they call them Mary Sues. Mary Sues are awful characters because they're perfect. They're in- uninteresting. They're boring. Perfect characters are always boring. And he didn't realize, but he was almost rewriting four pages of my book, where I say the same thing, in effect, that... Jesus was a perfect character, and that's a very interesting thing to notice, that if perfect characters are always boring, why are millions and millions of people Mm. worshiping him 2,000 years later? There's something different about him even in that. He managed to... Or, you know, if it's it's all myth, if if it's all just legend, then, then these myth makers, these um, mythologists, as one person called them, um, then then they came up with the only perfect character in all of literature who's also interesting. And I mean really perfect, and I mean really interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's just amazing. Yeah. How do you do that? It really <laughs> is. Yeah. So you also note in the book that Jesus' mission was just I forget how you word it, but it's like unprecedentedly ambitious, right? To reach the uttermost yes. parts of the earth yes. and him promising to be with his people forever. Um, and there were things that could have swayed Jesus off course if he wasn't perfect, if he w- didn't have this incomparable mm-hmm. character. Um, things that would definitely trip up you and I and anybody watching yeah. this. Um, so what were some of those things? And in what way was Jesus able to withstand those types of temptations, whereas we probably, well, definitely wouldn't? Yeah. Well, in Luke 4, we have him uh, giving you know, one version, at least, of an inaugural address to his uh, to his hometown in Nazareth. And they're all loving it when he's saying that today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, as he's been giving a scripture about uh, a messianic scripture about the kingdom to come, good days to come, especially for the poor, the oppressed, the captives from Isaiah. And then he says, well, yeah, um, in the days of um, Elisha, no one was healed of of, of, um, leprosy, but a Syrian person. In Elijah's day, it was a widow who wasn't a Jew who got blessed by Elijah. And what he was saying was, I'm not going to be your hometown boy. I'm going to talk to others, too. And they just about threw him over a cliff. They would have, except he passing through their midst, it says. He he went on his way. They got mad. that He had hometown pressure to, to just be our hometown boy. He had family pressure. He had political pressure. He had the pressure that came at the end when they were going to crucify him, and he kept going through it. And the way he kept staying with it was he knew the will of the Father, and he did the will of the Father, and he always did what the Father told him to do, he says. I, I, and he was a man of unmixed character. He was a man of, of singleness of purpose. Which, too, after I wrote the book, I was thinking, do, do we know of anybody else who's got singleness of purpose? Or maybe someone you'd say, he's his own person, and he's going to do what he wants. Jesus, you could say, he's his own person, and he's going to do what he wants. And this is not a political statement, but one name that came to mind was Donald Trump. Um, You could pick any politician. A person who's going to do what he wants, um, doesn't care that much about what the crowds say, doesn't have that big sensitivity to reputation. Can you imagine anybody like that saying, I'm going to do what I want, and what I want to do is always to serve you. 
and help mm. you and eventually to die for you. No. Jesus is very, very different. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And you you talk about some things throughout your book that he did in a different way. And one of those had to do around the, the issue of authority. You know, if we if we look mm-hmm. at even some of the uh, you know, the Gnostic Gospels, they would try to appeal to the authority of one of the eyewitnesses by calling it the right. Gospel of Thomas or something like that, um, because having that authority said something about you, what you were going to write down and, and mm-hmm. how much people would believe that and take that to heart. And Jesus approached this in a very uh, interesting way. Talk about that a bit, if you would. He did. Yeah. The, he. Uh, this is one of the things he never did, is he never said, thus says the Lord. The prophets said that over 400 times. And they did it because they were speaking the words of God, but they couldn't speak it as if it was their words. They had to say, I'm quoting, I'm speaking for, I'm saying what I'm instructed to say. Jesus comes into, into town, and he's, we, we see it in the Sermon on the Mount, especially where he will say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Yeah. You've heard what is, that it was said, but I say to you, he speaks with the same authority as the prophets did. They were speaking for God. He spoke with the same authority, but he was speaking as God. He was speaking in a way that no one could get away with speaking unless they were God, because he spoke with the very authority of one who could say, this is the truth, because I say it is. Mm-hmm. And that's really what he did. Now, in that first century context, how how mm-hmm. would the people have received that? Is that something they picked up on? Is that something we we can look oh, at did. now? And yeah, it's you see it in the last verse of Matthew seven, right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, that says the crowds were astonished because he was speaking as one who had authority and not as the scribes, and. To find out how the scribes spoke, I went and I looked at the Talmud, which was written beginning um, a century or or so, over a period of centuries, really, but starting roughly a little later than Jesus' time. And what you see in there is, is, well, Rabbi says, uh, Rev says this, and Sage so-and-so says this, and this is what we come up with. In other words, they, they call in all these other rabbis as their Uh, as their authorities. And it's not that much different than we do today when we bring in different people as authorities that we cite in our research papers or whatever. Jesus didn't do that. He just said, but I say to you. They hadn't heard anybody say, but I say to you. And that's what astonished them. I used to think when I first read that, he spoke like he had real authority. (laughs) No. He, He said, but I say to you. And he said, this is the one, you and I were both at a conference a few weeks ago. I, I, I want to try this someday. I want to get up on stage, <laughs> guest speaking somewhere at a conference and say, okay, you can set your minds at ease. I did not come to abolish the Bible. <laughs> Jesus said pretty much that in Matthew chapter 5. What? And then he said, I came to fulfill it. That's a great way to get thrown out of a conference. Uh, or but jesus said it as if maybe he the the hearers were thinking that's a possibility it would be like me standing at the base of of the rocky mountains with a pickaxe saying don't worry i'm not chopping the whole thing down but he said it and apparently there was some reason for him to say it yeah because he had the authority is the reason yeah well speaking of things that he didn't do Mm-hmm. One thing I had never thought about before is the fact that Jesus didn't refer to God as our Father, except no. when he was instructing the disciples on how to pray. So he why is did. that? Go into that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's one of those strange things you realize when you look through, okay, what's going on here? I, I picked on the, up on that when I was actually meeting with a, a would-be cult leader who kept talking about God as my father my father, my father. And that felt wrong to me when I heard that. And I went looking. I thought, nobody called God my father except for Jesus. And Jesus never called him our father. In fact, after his resurrection, he's, he, he really carefully avoids it. He tells Mary, don't cling to me, because, but tell my bro- go tell my brothers that I go to my father and your father, to my God and your God. 
He makes a distinction there. And the only way that makes sense is if he had a different relationship. I mean, a way different relationship that he, that we do have, Jesus came to be human. So he had, he has that, that he shares with us, but it's a different level. In the book, I told the story of a, an Episcopal priest. I used that because, specifically because Episcopals, Episcopalians may call their priests father, and they can marry and have kids. So this Episcopal priest has a son, and his son has a, has a, a friend. And the son and the friend think, uh, boy, wouldn't it be fun to climb up to the top of the church and look out at town from the belfry? And, and, and so I imagine the, the actual son of this, of this priest saying, well, okay, let's go ask our father. No, he wouldn't do that. The other boy could call him father, just as the son could, but no, not the same way. It's a different relationship. He would say, let me go ask my dad. Mm. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the, the other boy would say, oh, yeah, okay, let's go ask the father. It's different. Yeah. I think that's what was going on with Jesus. He had a relationship with the father that's different than our relationship by far. So is that, like, what do you make of that as far as the theological significance of that? Does that speak to his deity? What did, what yes. what do you think is that significance there? Yeah, I, I think it does. And it's especially important for those who follow the skeptics who say that Jesus' deity never appears anywhere except in the book of John. This is where it appears in in a different form. is His use of authority, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. His avoidance of terms uh, like our Father in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. He's acting like God mm. when he does that. It's not final proof of his deity, but it's strongly suggestive that, mm -hmm. yes, he is really God walking on earth. And speaking of those sort of characteristics about Jesus that would support the idea that his deity wasn't a later development. This wasn't just something that mm -hmm. people came up with later as they were trying to right. explain things. Um, you know, Jesus being fully God, of course, and fully human. Uh, one thing you bring out that, again, I'd never really thought about is that Jesus didn't have to have faith. He right. did, did Jesus put faith in God, or how did that work? Because that was such an interesting point you brought out. Yeah, I have been asking and asking and asking, and I have never yet, and if someone listening to this podcast knows an exception, I want to hear it. I have never yet heard anyone else raise this question, and I've been trying to find it. I want to find the, the others who have who've raised this question. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus had faith. Yeah. He never says it. No one ever says it about him, and that is very, very strange. Because it was the one virtue that he taught most frequently. More often than love, he taught faith. He emphasized it over and over and over again. He's teaching it. Is he practicing it or is he a hypocrite or what? I mean, we hear other virtues of Jesus, his compassion, his love, his obedience. We don't hear faith. What's going on there? And... I thought about this, and I, I don't know that everyone agrees with me on this. I've heard different opinions, but the only thing that makes sense to me on as answering that is that, to put it in, in shortest terms, is that God doesn't have faith in God. God just knows God. Faith is a term that is absolutely a term of knowledge. Faith is always based on knowledge, unless it's stupidity. Stupidity and faith, stupidity and faith are not synonyms. So when we say we have faith in God, it's because we know something about God, but there's always an unknown. I have, I am quite sure, really solid knowledge that Jesus rose from the dead, that he made a promise that I would rise from the dead, and that he keeps his promises. But, you know, I haven't risen from the dead yet. I don't have that experience to prove it. So there's faith. Jesus had knowledge, but he had knowledge where he just knew. Um, for him to say he had faith in God would be like me saying, I have faith I can scratch my eyebrows. It's just, okay, do I have any doubt that I can scratch my eyebrows? No. 
but is faith the right word to use for it? No, it's a dumb word to use for it. You don't use that word, and you wouldn't use the word faith for Jesus' relationship with the Father. Why? Because he knew him that completely, thoroughly, absolutely well. Yeah. Now, you mentioned some people disagree with you on that. What are some of the points that other people might bring out to explain why Jesus, you know, why we don't see that language used in reference to Jesus? Well, I think that it, I, I have trouble coming up with any other points. I think it's just people are uncomfortable with the idea that Jesus didn't have faith. They think he must have. Yeah. And I would say that in a, in a certain sense of the term that we don't usually use, certain Jesus had trust in the Father, uh, but to an absolute degree to which the word faith is just inappropriate. Yeah. It's interesting. So your book is sort of laid out in two parts. The first part deals mm-hmm. with the character of Jesus, his brilliance. There's so much we haven't even gotten to talk about, There's his brilliance, mm-hmm. his paradoxical leadership, and all these kinds of things. And then the second half sort of moves into how skeptics might respond to some of the things you say in part one. So before mm-hmm. we move into that, because I, I, I want to get to some of these skeptical claims, because you know there's probably sure. people watching this thinking, yeah, but, but yeah, mm-hmm. but how about this? So we'll get to some of that. But is there anything else that you want to bring out as far as the the character of Jesus before we get into that, because there's just so much packed in to this to this first half of this book. All I will say is that it was an incredible study for me. And I've been a Christian since 1975, 46 years, if I got the arithmetic, arithmetic right. And I have always known that the doctrine of his deity, I have always known it was appropriate to worship Jesus as no one other could be appropriate to worship. But as I saw him and his greatness through this, that changed for me. Instead of knowing that I could worship Jesus, I couldn't help but worship him. I couldn't mm-hmm. help but fall before him on, on, the, on the floor and cry out, you are my God. He is so much greater than me, so much better than me, so infinitely better than any person that I have ever encountered, imagined, whatever. He's better than I realized. Mm. He's, he's greater than I knew. It was a great discovery for me. Well, I have to say, that's the effect it had on me as I was reading oh. through. You know, I, I told you this well, in an email. I didn't quite, you know, I yeah. didn't know what to expect. I just, you know, it's mm-hmm. a new book. I wanted to read it. And I remember reading it on a plane, and I'm reading this, and that is that is the effect it had on me. It made me just mm-hmm. want to bow down and worship because I I don't think I realized, and I still don't fully, of course, but I, I hadn't thought that deeply about just how, just, you know, it's not just the doctrine of sinlessness. Like this is, he is so good and so much better. And he makes all the right choices that I wouldn't make. And, you know, it, it, yeah, so it definitely has had that effect on me, too. But I can certainly oh, cool. see how skeptics might come and say, yeah, but this or that. So, um, you know, a, a lot of, well, really everything that you're saying sort of hinges on the Gospels being accurate accounts of Jesus' life, right? Because if they're right. not accurate accounts, then none of this really matters. And so you quote a best-selling author, Resla Aslan, and I'm going to read that quote from him and get your response to it. But mm-hmm. here's what he says. The Gospels are not, nor were they ever meant to be, historical documentation of Jesus' life. They are not eyewitness accounts of Jesus' words and deeds recorded by people who knew him. They are testimonies of faith composed by communities of faith and written many years after the events they describe. I I feel like this is the perfect quote to respond to because, Tom, in my work sort of Mm -hmm. challenging the movement of progressive Christianity, I can't tell you how often I see a comment like this almost verbatim where there's there's really no justification for it. There's no information given to support the claims. It's just the claim is like this. They were never meant to be seen as historical documents. They're not eyewitnesses' accounts. People wrote this many years later. Maybe somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. Uh, but but mm-hmm. this, we're reading it all wrong, and we're just being too wooden and too literalist in our approach to things. And so, yeah. I'd love to for you to have an opportunity to respond to that particular claim. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of ways to respond to it. There's there are, and there have there's a, a rich literature of reasons why it. It doesn't. The, the legend theory doesn't fit. Everything from uh, the the type of 
um, well, the time, especially the time between the events and when the legend supposedly came to be, it's it's impossible. That there are lots of reasons to doubt that it could conceivably be legend, but this is a different one. This is a new one, and this is where I said earlier I take the story seriously as a story. We have a story of Jesus. It's in four parts. They fit together. They're inter- interdependent. They don't all say the same thing, but. It's, if you think of that as the effect, effects have causes. What was the cause that brought about these stories, this one story, this, this one character of Jesus who is so consistent in so many ways? And the skeptics will say, well, the, there's inconsistencies between the Gospels. It's the number of people at the tomb or whether Jairus came with his servant to have his daughter heal, healed and stuff like that. I say... You're talking about plot points. I want to talk about Jesus' character. He's very consistent. the The question is, where did, how did that come to be? Where did this Jesus character come from? And their theory is that it evolved as a legend, and not just as a legend. You know, um, they, they get into more specifics, is especially Bart Ehrman, who's the top selling author on this, perhaps the top scholar. And he talks about the telephone game where one person tells another and another person tells another. And and it's not like the game you play with kids in a classroom where they're all the same age, the same socioeconomic status, same neighborhood, and so on. He, he emphasizes in several of his books that it's, um, it's first, second, fifth, 19th hand across countries, across cultures, across languages. And I can see it's just fanning out across the, the northern and southern rims of the Mediterranean and up into Asia Minor, and the story's going everywhere. And it's changing because of this telephone game. In fact, he says, what happens to stories when, when you do that? They change. And I'm thinking, Bart, change? Change? It's, it's like, no. That, okay, yeah, they change, yes. But that's... That, that's that's putting it way too loudly. They're going to get corrupted. They're going to get twisted. They're going to get distorted. They're going to get changed in big ways. And the details of the events are going to change, but the character is going to change. Someone's going to say, oh, my goodness, Jesus never said, thus says the Lord. We better stick that in. Someone's going to look, where's his faith? We better put mm. that in. Um, how, never, how come he never says our father? Someone's going to stick that in somewhere, and they don't. Mm. And something, something tied all these legends together across thousands and thousands, you know, thousands of miles, uh, days and days of travel. What, what could possibly do that? The, 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 the changes that would have had to happen would certainly have corrupted the character of Jesus, and would have had to do it in different ways in the four places it finally landed, the Gospels we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He would have had to come out different, Mm -hmm. and he doesn't. I don't think the legend theory explains the effect, which is the story that we have in Jesus. Yeah. I think it fails. And and sometimes people will say, too, that, you know, just playing the skeptic here, it seems like Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very— sort of talking about things in one way. And then you mm-hmm. have John over here who is talking about it in a completely different way, seemingly. How, how would you respond to that one? Yeah, well, you still have the same detail level character, as I just said. My best answer to that would be to go read a new book by Lydia McGrew called Eye of the Beholder, where she goes in very, very de- great detail in answering the question, is, John, is Jesus the same person in the book of John? And he is. There are so many things that where you see consistencies. You you read the last part of Matthew 11, and it sounds like John wrote it. Mm. It's a passage where he says, come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden. Uh, people will say that Jesus spoke in longer discourses in one gospel than another. She goes in and statistically shows that. We're, no, he doesn't. Um, we have uh, really... If there's any difference, it's in language. You, you get a sense the, of John speaking kind of different kind of an approach to language. And it's similar to what he 
wrote in the letters that we have, first, second, third John. And so people will say, well, this is John reinventing Jesus out of his own mind. But the differences in language are not that great and not that much different than reading the Bible in New International Version or today's English version compared to New American Standard Version. Yeah. They, it's it's uh, entirely possible that John spent so much time reflecting on what Jesus said that he started to talk like Jesus rather than Jesus sounding like John. It's John sounding like Jesus. Mm. And I've heard it said, too, you know, with John sort of being the last uh, to mm-hmm. write, you know, it's, it's written later than the others. He knew, he was aware of the others. He he knew yeah. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and he knew what they said. He knew what, you, that they they got the history. He, you, here's what happened. Everybody knew what happened. And then John was bringing to his gospel a more theological approach to what he already knew everybody knew had happened. But he's yeah. trying to show you the theological significance of some of those events, too. And I, that that really made sense to me a lot when I would read through John and you see, oh, yeah, like he doesn't have the need to go through and explain, okay, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. He knows you already know that. He's trying to talk to you about the theological significance behind some of these events, right. possibly. And, and people will say that he's theologizing and thus creating, recreating a person to fit his theology. That's just not necessarily the case, because right. if you, I, I would think that following Jesus for a few years, seeing him die and rise again, it would take, you know, given who they were, it would take a long time to go, yes, he was God. Oh, my goodness, he was God. What does it mean he was God? It would take a while to think that through. It would take more than just a half a day or a year or, or 10 years. Mm. John had more time to think it through. He did. And and that's okay. Why why would that be weird? Yeah. And he was so close with Jesus too. Like yeah. there was such a close relationship there. Yeah. So, very cool. Mm-hmm. Uh one of the things that I found kind of interesting is this whole concept of cognitive dissonance. So, yeah. one of the skeptical claims being I think this is something that Bart Ehrman has put forward that you know, mm-hmm. you might say, okay, well let's even say that the gospels give us an accurate enough depiction of Jesus' life and you know, you have these disciples who had totally bought in to who he was. They left their jobs and their homes and they followed him and they left everything to do that. This is the guy they were waiting for. This was the Messiah that would overthrow the corrupt Roman government and be their king and uh, and mm-hmm. then he gets crucified. And, you know, maybe they just sort of had to pivot to the—I'm playing the skeptic here. They had to pivot to sure. the idea that Jesus is more of a, you know, spiritual king. Uh, and and I think that's sort of similar to the claim Bart Ehrman makes. So what do you think? Yeah. Uh, could it have just been cognitive dissonance or, or how do what, how we process that question? Yeah. Well, the cognitive dissonance, the theory comes out of work by Leon Festinger, who— wrote it first in a book that I read as an undergrad called When Prophecy Fails and about a a group in Michigan that was expecting aliens from the planet Clarion to come snatch them away uh, because they were the right kind of people doing the right kind of thing, following their instructions, snatch them away at midnight and, uh, and then the earth would be destroyed and they'd be saved. And they invested a whole lot of their lives and money and reputation in that. And funny thing, this is not news. It didn't happen. But they expected it to happen. And when it didn't, they had some very, very dark hours. Uh, it only took until, I think, 4.45 in the morning, though, before their leaders said, wait a minute, I have a new word from the aliens. God has seen our sincerity, and he has spared the world. We weren't, In other words, we weren't wrong after all. We just saved the world. The, the theory that this was similar to what was is the theory is that the disciples did something similar we invested everything in jesus now he's gone wait a minute no he's resurrected we have a resurrected jesus we were right after all our egos are saved essentially the problem with that theory is that again we look at the character of jesus the most perfect character by far ever invented ever in any literature the one who has inspired so much by way of love, of giving, of selflessness, of forgiveness, of of so much good stuff. And we're going to say that he was invented by kooks on the same scale as the folks who thought they'd saved Earth from aliens 
back in 1955. Um, that's just the wrong sort of person to invent a character like Jesus. There are other problems with the cognitive dissonance theory, but I think that's the worst one is kooks don't invent a Jesus. You just can't imagine yeah. that happening. Well, and you t just as I think it through too, a, a bruised ego or even yeah. your world just kind of crashing down is, isn't going to maintain you through being beaten and whipped and stoned and martyred. No. You know, you're going to cave at some point. I guarantee, you know, if, those, if that other story, those people had had to maintain that, you know, through torture, I, I don't know if they would have because... No, I don't think you're, so. It's, a bruised ego is not enough to get you through that, I don't think. I don't think so either. Yeah. No. So uh, you mentioned earlier some of the other things that skeptics will bring up. And one that I think is kind of interesting is, you know, a skeptic could say, well, because I hear this a lot also in progressive Christianity. You know, I could, I could never worship a God who and then fill in the blank because I could think mm -hmm. of myself, I could think of a better way to do it. I hear progressive Christians talk like that, even yeah. in regards to things like the Canaanite conquest. And so um, to just take the issue of slavery, you know, um, why didn't Jesus make a big stand against slavery or advocate for abolishing it or even use his miraculous powers to end it? Why, why didn't he do something like that? And does that throw a wrench in your whole idea that he's too good to be false? Well, no, it doesn't, because he wouldn't use his miraculous powers to end it, because he's not that way with anybody. He lets us live our lives and make our decisions, including ones that have damaging outcomes. And then he, through the gentle change that comes through people following him, he makes things better through us. That's his way. Why he does it that way, that's his decision, but that is clearly consistent with who he is and who God has always been. If he had said, I'm here to save you from your sins and abolish slavery, he would have done neither. He was in no position to abolish slavery. He, he could have said, I don't like slavery. What he did say was, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. What he did say was uh, to emphasize love. No, uh, no, no one has greater love than to lay down their life for another. Um, he did um, show... His, his, his own love to the outcasts. He did demonstrate these kinds of things. And so, in that sense, he set the stage for what gradually over the next several years, centuries really, became the first culture in the history of the world that had the economic means to own slaves, but chose not to. Mm. So, gradually it happened. But if he had said, we're going to abolish slavery, his... Um, his whole mission would have been upended as far as teaching and showing uh, the life of God and, and eventually dying for our sins because of the person he was. He would have been killed, but it wouldn't have been for the person he was. It would have been political. Mm, interesting. And I guess that's sort of similar to the objection that would be brought up against, you know, women's rights. Why didn't he make a bigger stand for women's rights? And, of course, you know, when I think about that one, I'm just thinking— there's the way he treated women was unprecedented. He was born into oh, yes. a, a culture that you know I, I've read even in the Talmud where it said better the law be burnt than given to a woman. Or you know you can read in Josephus about uh, the t it took the testimony of two women to be equal to one man or something along those lines. So what would you add to that about uh, you know maybe the question why didn't Jesus just make a declaration? You know women we're going to elevate women to to this level and this is just the way it is. Yeah. I, it's hard to imagine how he would have done that would have, that would have left us any less confused than we already are. <laughs> you know, to, to a systematic theology of man and woman, it just, it, it, it's, it's going to be chapters long mm -hmm. to get it right. And that's getting it right for our uh, our our mindset as people who read in a certain way in terms of systematic, you know, logical and so on. So he did it by demonstration instead. Yeah. And he did demonstrate um, not that men and women have equal roles, but that they have equal worth. And he showed it. Yeah. Very he sure so. did over and over again. I mean, speaking to yeah. the woman at the well and uh, just the, the women followers that, that he welcomed into his circle and, I see that it's so evident to me when I read the mm -hmm. Gospels how Jesus was with women and uh, just with with 
people in general. And that speaks to his incomparable character that you bring out so well mm -hmm. in this book. Um, in a moment, we're going to go to the Patreon-only portion of the interview. So if you want to uh, take—it's kind of like an after party. It's so it's— Basically, mm -hmm. just sort of like a five to ten minute hangout where my Patreon supporters get to ask the questions and we have a little bit of extra discussion. If you want to be a part of that, you can go to patreon.com slash Alisa Childers and you can select tier four to be able to uh, have access to that bonus content. Uh, if tier three, I think, gets you in the Facebook group um, or that might be switched. Uh, but you get to ask the questions mm -hmm. for this bonus content. But uh, Tom, just before we go into that, uh, as we close out this portion of mm -hmm our conversation. What do you want people to know? If you could leave us with one thing, just what's on your heart about the person of Jesus and what you would want to communicate about him? Well, one thing is if you want a, a preview, you can go to my blog at Thinking Christian, thinkingchristian.net, and actually download a chapter of the book, and, and you can get a taste of the book. But again, the, as far as Jesus goes, he is the only example anywhere in history or literature of a life perfectly lived. I even tell skeptics, I say, you know, don't worry about the miracles. Don't worry about the rest. Just read the life of Jesus because you've only got one shot at life. You could make it up on your own or you could follow a really good example. Well, Jesus is more than a really good example. I, what I'm trying to do there is get them to look at who Jesus is. And I think they will see something more than they expected. He is um, greater than I knew, and the more I read him, the more I, I fall in love with, with, with Jesus, and the more I want to be with him. I, it's, uh, it's, it's just so well worth the time spent with him in, in fellowship and in learning about him and growing maybe more into his likeness. And Tom, where can people find you online? I know you you are pretty prolific in your article writing, and and so you mentioned the uh, yes. where they can get a chapter of the book. But where else can they find you online? Yeah, yeah. There's thinkingchristian.net. That's uh, my blog. It's been act oh, semi active. It, it was very active for a long time, fourteen years now, uh, but more now at the stream stream.org, where I'm a senior editor. All and right. I hope you come there. Very good. Well, I want to thank my guest, uh, Tom Gilson, for joining today for a rich discussion on the character of Jesus. If you're watching on YouTube, it always helps if you subscribe, if you like it, if you leave a comment, it helps get the message out to more people. If you're listening on audio platforms like iTunes and Spotify, again, leaving a five-star review. Uh, if you saw this podcast shared on social media, liking it, sharing it, commenting, all of that helps with the algorithms to get the message out to more people. Thank you so much for listening and for watching today, and we'll see you next time.